Okay. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. Please sit down. <laughs> okay. So uh, next in our agenda, I actually want to discuss two smaller topics that are practically very important, and then we'll move on uh, to our uh, next bigger block of lectures on neural networks. But before that, I want to cover some aspects. In particular, one uh, aspect that arises very often in classification tasks, uh, namely the issue with class imbalance, right? The situation where your data looks something like this, right? So basically, uh, classification problems where, say, in the binary setting, one class is much, much more frequent than the other class. Okay, can anyone think of reasons of why we might, might face such situations? Where one, one class is much more common than the other class? Sorry, once again? Block tests. Bullet. Okay, so I'm. Blood. Blood tests, yes. Okay, so medical tests. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yes, absolutely. Great example, right? So medical examples, right? So, so hopefully there's far fewer sick people than healthy people, right? Or there might be certain diseases that are very rare, right? And that's, uh, we have very few um, examples of, of, the, uh, of, uh, of the class um, with the disease, right? So that's one, uh, one, one domain, absolutely. Other examples? And one you had talked about, right, is sort of spam filtering kind of examples, right? So hopefully there's far more non-spam messages than spam messages, even though that's maybe not as clear. Other examples related to that? Say things like fraud detection, right? So thinking about trying to classify financial transactions of whether they're fraudulent or not, right? Hopefully most transactions are non-fraudulent, right? And you want to discuss want to uh, detect um, fraudulent transactions. Other examples? Once again? Real criminals. Real criminals, I see. Okay. Anyways, yeah, so, so certainly uh, lots, of, uh, lots of examples, right, where, uh, where you might have um, imbalanced data, right? So one that I, so process monitoring, right, maybe you want to sort of detect um, right, you have some, some industrial process, right, that sort of produces some goods, right, manufactures something, right, you want to do quality checks, right, and hopefully most products are good, but a few ones might not be. Okay, so uh, these are all examples. One that's maybe not as obvious, but also where these things are extremely prevalent are in things like uh, information retrieval, right, or recommender systems, so these sort of things, right. If you think about the positive class as being examples of items you like and the negative classes things you don't like right or sort of particular with respect to some having something in mind right so think about ha having a particular search query right and you want to classify documents whether they're relevant with respect to that query or not right most pages are probably not going to be relevant with respect to the query okay <laughs> so plenty of examples where you have um in some cases extremely large imbalance right that the positive examples are far far fewer uh, than the negative examples Okay, so we have the convention here, by the way, that sort of positive is the rare class. Okay, so it's just, uh, have to break the tie somehow. Right? And of course, this can happen in, in beyond binary classification problems as well, right? But as, as you said, for now, we focus on binary classification tasks. So what's the issue uh, with imbalanced data? What can go wrong? I mean, why is it a big deal, right? Why, why not just, I mean, say, who cares, right? So uh, what might go wrong if you have imbalanced data? Any thoughts? Yeah, so, so you might have preferences of, a, of some mistakes over other mistakes, right? So classifying positives as negative, right? Um, having false negatives, right? Or the opposite case, having false positives might have different implications, right? So again, in spam filtering maybe, right? As we already had mentioned a few lectures ago, right? If you send an important email message to the spam folder, that might be more problematic than letting slip through the occasional spam message into your inbox, right? medical examples, of course, as well, right? So depending on the classification, right? 
you might have to treat the patient in some way or the other, right? And so misclassification in one way or the other can have very different consequences, right? Uh, so uh, these are, so, so, so certainly that's sort of one, one important aspect, right? Which sort of hints at accuracy not necessarily being the right metric, right? Just counting the number of mistakes is maybe something naive, right? If there's two different kinds of mistakes you can make. So that's an important, uh, important aspect of this, right? Um, what might technically go wrong? So even if you don't care about sort of differences between false positives and false negatives, is there something that might be, might go wrong? If you think about using these kinds of learning algorithms we've been discussing based on empirical risk minimization, like, right, the perceptron or SVMs and these sort of things, what might be an issue? Right. So that, that's a good example, right? So if you were to use something like stochastic gradient uh, descent for optimization, if you pick uniformly at random, right, maybe you just miss the positive examples all the time, right? And even if you, want, if you were to do something like gradient descent, you actually, every iteration, look at every example, there's still things that can go wrong, right? If you even think about just the formulation of the optimization problem, well, basically, if you think about empirical risk minimization, right, you have a sum of terms, right, one, sum of loss functions, one for each data point, right? And there's a bunch of these terms that measure how well you do on the negative examples, and there's a bunch of terms that measure how well you do on the positive examples, right? Now, of course, if you have extreme class imbalance, there's very, very few terms that belong to the positive class, right? So they don't affect the optimization objective very much, right? That's also related to the point that was raised. Right? So this is sort of some of the issues uh, that arise. Right? So first is this sort of accuracy, not necessarily being the right metric, right? preferring one kind of mistake over the other. Um, and this other is sort of this, this minority class instances contribute little to the optimization, right? to the objective. Right? And sort of this potential issue with using something like stochastic gradient descent might, might be a consequence of this, right? or even just the formulation of the optimization problem. Um, right, where you say you have your R hat of W, right, which is the sum of all examples, and of course I can group them by all the positive examples, right, YI uh, equals plus of L of uh, W and X I Y I, right, plus the sum over all I such that Y I is minus of the loss X, uh, X I Y I, Right? So if you think about those two terms, right, if this is sort of the, the positive part and this is sort of the negative part, right, then somehow you easily end up in a situation where this first part is substantially dominated by the second part. Somehow, right? And so effectively it doesn't really contribute something to the, uh, to the objective. Okay, so I want to discuss sort of how to fix these issues right, and what to do with it. And let me actually start with the second part so this issue, right, with sort of minority class instances contributing too little to the empirical risk, and then we'll talk about um, sort of how to, what to use to replace accuracy, right, and how can we optimize such things. Okay, so the second part, um, right, so what if we have an extremely imbalanced data set, but we have algorithms that sort of only really work well if you have balanced data, right, what do we do? Well, there's two, two sort of general strategies, right? One, we could sort of invent special purpose methods for the balanced case, for the unbalanced case, right? Or we could sort of try to use the methods we have that sort of work well in the balanced case and apply them, right, in the imbalanced setting, right? And latter, all right, of course, there's some easy ways of sort of thinking about doing that um, by essentially sort of trying to convert an imbalanced data set into a balanced one, right? And so uh, there's two obvious solutions right, you might think of. Right? One is, of course, subsampling. Right? You're saying you have the, the majority class, right? but you just maybe throw away a lot of the positive examples right? so that you, in the end, end up with a balanced, uh, balanced data set. Right? So say you drop examples uniformly and random until you're left with a situation where you have equally, equally many positive and negative examples. Right? Or the opposite, something like upsampling, right? where you somehow duplicate simply the uh, minority class examples, right? Count them multiple times. Maybe you perturb them slightly, maybe you just uh, use them multiple times, right? So uh, sort of these pictures. 
right? I mean, that's sort of a, the, the simplest possible fix, right? And that actually is sometimes used, right? So sometimes simple ideas actually work, right? Of course, there's issues with both of these, right? I mean, can anyone point it to issues? So these are basically kinds of reductions, right? You would sort of try to reduce this imbalance problem to a balanced problem, right? So we've used reductions before, right? Sort of reducing nonlinear classification to a linear classification, that's sort of another kind of reduction here, right? So what's the issues potentially with these kinds of reductions? Yeah? Sure. Right, so, so for, for downsampling, right? Uh, you certainly, I mean, throwing away data is typically, if you can avoid it somehow, it's typically not a good idea, right? Um, I mean, you might lose information about the majority class somehow, right? Where is it, right? What's its, how it's, uh, it might lose information about this distribution. And of course, this upsampling, right? If you just duplicate points, somehow it seems like you should be able to do something better, right? Because you just sort of create more work. You're sort of not really generating more, more data somehow, right? And of course, if you do choose to add noise, right, to sort of choose to add synthetic uh, examples, then of course you have to be very careful with how you do that, right? Um, at this point, I want to just briefly remark that actually sort of adding synthetic examples, sort of injecting noise to create auxiliary training data is actually something that's very widely used in practice, okay? But so just combating uh, imbalance with it is maybe a little bit of a, uh, not necessarily the right thing to do. Okay, but in principle, right, I mean, these are sort of approaches one could apply, right, to sort of just come back to the uh, imbalance setting, uh, the balance setting, and then apply the, the standard algorithm if, uh, that we have, right? And of course, the question is, uh, can we, and so this is sort of what we, what we had here, right? Uh, so if you downsample, then you have fewer data, right, which is actually good, right, because sort of solving the problem is faster, maybe, right? But of course, you throw away information. So maybe it's not so good after all, right? And upsampling does make use of all the data, um, but then, uh, of course, in, in principle, it's sort of more expensive, right? Uh, you don't have to store that, uh, that additional data. It might slow down training, right, depending on what kind of method you use. So the question is, can you do something else, right? And if, let's look at that alternative avenue. So instead of using this reduction, let's sort of think about maybe let's try to take the methods we know and try to adjust them a little bit, right, to, to make them work uh, for, this, uh, for this imbalanced setting, right? And so how might we do this? Well, so if you think about upsampling, right? Say the simplest form of upsampling, right? right? So we basically just take the minority class examples, the positive examples, and just duplicating them multiple times, right? You can sort of think about what happens with the empirical risk if we do that, right? And of course, I mean, it's easy to see what happens to that empirical risk, right? You just sort of multiply the contributions to the loss, right, of the loss, right? Uh, that comes from the minority class examples by some amount, right? How, by how much you upsample. And of course, you don't actually have to physically duplicate data in order to do this, right? So you can just directly build it uh, into the last function, right? That's a really simple idea, right? And that leads to a family of techniques called cost-sensitive classification. Something to have heard about um, often actually works, uh, works very well. It's a really simple fix to, uh, to essentially everything that we've discussed before. Right? So you basically simulate this upsampling by just scaling the loss, which is just sort of the same as, as repeating, duplicating examples that, uh, that come from the minority class. Right? And so, uh, so if you had some original loss function L, right, now what you would do is you would basically create a new cost-sensitive loss function, right? L sub CS for cost-sensitive, that is just the original one scaled by some uh, non-negative number uh, CY, right, um, where CY basically tells you how much do you care about uh, this particular class, right, say the positive or the negative class, right, and that idea you can of course apply to any of the cost functions we've, uh, we've discussed, right, the perceptron loss, the hinge loss, and so on, right, so that's sort of the simplest thing you can do, right, and now of course you can sort of try to directly optimize uh, that uh, that resulting, uh, resulting objective, right? And of course, now what's going to happen? Well, so you're going to basically just scale the gradient by that same constant CY, right? So it's simple to implement. Now, at this point, I want to come back to this comment that was brought up uh, from the audience, right? If you were to use something like stochastic gradient descent, right, and just pick points uniformly at random, then, of course, this can 
be potentially problematic, right? So and this, what, what's going to happen if you just do something like stochastic gradient descent? Well, so in this case, your cost function simulates upsampling, right? So your, say, minority class examples are no longer dominated by the majority class examples, right? But of course, the chance of actually sampling one of these examples becomes very, uh, becomes very small, right? And now there's some ways of, um, of fixing that where basically instead of uniformly sampling the examples, uh, you can uh, use non-uniform distributions, right? You can sort of sample the minority class examples um, sort of more frequently, but then of course you have to adjust for the weight. So you can use ideas uh, related to important sampling in order to reduce the variance of that, uh, of that estimate of the gradient. But I'm not going to discuss this in too much detail. I just wanted to point it out uh, since this issue was brought up in, uh, in the audience, right? But if you think about just doing gradient descent, right, computing the actual gradient, right, then that's basically everything you need to do, right? So you, you sort of just essentially scale the different contributions to the loss, right, and, um, and that sort of implicitly takes care of this, uh, of this upsampling idea. Okay, so that's basically, uh, it's basically the, the idea, right? So, I mean, that's what's happening to these losses, right? You just change the slope of those, of those parameters, right? The same thing for the hinge loss, where everything is just now shifted, right? And starting at the, uh, starting at the one. Okay, and so, uh, right, then, of course, some other, um, uh, so, so, so the same kind of learning algorithms, right? Applying gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent on that modified loss function, um, in principle, at least, is going to uh, going to work, right? So uh, let me just show this briefly. Here is basically um, what happens. So if we use um, so this uh, an imbalanced data set here, right? And we can sort of use these different training algorithms. And what we do here is we basically um, sort of look at the trade off right, between the false positives and false negatives, right? So one quick question is maybe we should discuss here, right? Oops. Um, we think about, uh, think about this. So basically, where did I have? Uh, okay. So now one, one remark, let me actually just create a brief uh, new slide here. So basically, so if you think about, say, the perceptron, right, we have our empirical risk, right, which is sum over all, um, all data points, right, so say sum over i of the positive examples. Um, of this cost-sensitive loss, right? So we now would have our C plus here, right? Of this loss function, X, I, Y, I, right? Um, plus the sum over I such that Y, I is negative of C minus, right? Of that resulting loss. Right? So now, in some sense, I have two uh, tuning parameters. So I have C plus and I have C minus, right? But do I really need two tuning parameters? Or can I get rid of one of them? Well, so I mean, if you think about just this cost function, if I scale it by any scalar, it's still the same cost function. So I have the same optimal solutions, right? So in some sense, I could just fix one of these constants to one. Right? So uh, I could just say, without loss of generality, uh, I can fix C minus uh, to, uh, to 1. Right? Um, because then, um, right, so what really only matters is the ratio, right, between C plus and, uh, and, and C minus, right? So, 
So basically, uh, so the observation, right, is that if I think about this parameterized in terms of C plus and C minus, right, then of course our hat of W um, and C minus, right, I can relate this to our hat, right, of W, if I just take C plus and one, right, uh, by basically uh, uh, just multiplying by C plus divided by C minus, right? I hope I got it right. So if you take this, you divide by C, uh, sorry, this doesn't make sense. So let's say, let's, let's do the following, right? Let's just say, um, if I scale everything, right, by alpha C plus and alpha C minus, right, then this is, of course, just uh, 1 over alpha this, right? And then, of course, I can just set 1 over C minus, then I get uh, 1 over alpha here, right? So C minus times uh, 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 C minus times r hat of w, and then here I just have C plus over C minus, uh, comma 1, right? So I can just keep one of these parameters fixed, and this is now my tuning parameter. Right, because this obviously, this constant in front doesn't matter, right? Okay, so, so in the end, I just have one additional hyperparameter, right? And of course, that's, I have to think about how to select it, and that is what we're going to discuss in the following, right? But just to get some intuition, right? So if you go back uh, to, to our demo here, right? This is now this cost ratio, the C plus over C minus, right? And we can, uh, we can sort of see what happens as we change this value, for, say, for the SVM, right, if you use um, a very, very small ratio, right, then basically um, we care about mistakes of one case. So if this is the, let me see, which is this class, so this is supposed to be the positive class, right, I really don't at all care about um, false negatives in this case. So this ratio of C plus over C minus is very small. So uh, basically, I can just say everything is blue, right? Everything is the negative class, right? That's sort of what happens here, right? On the other hand, if I increase this loss, right, then you see how the decision boundary moves, right? And at some point here, it decides rather I want to classify everything, um, everything as red, right? Because my... Uh, false negatives are really problematic. I really care about the false negatives, right? So that's pretty, pretty natural, right? So the, as you vary this, this constant-sensitiveness parameter, right, you sort of get different solutions. Okay? Good. Uh, yeah, and so now the question is, of course, how do we go about picking that number, right? Or how should we think about that resulting trade-off? Right, that's the next... Natural question that arises here, right? And so, uh, so you think about, right, just as an extreme example here, right? If we, if we have this data set, right, and um, say, uh, suppose I have a classifier, right, and I say it has 99% accuracy, right? Is it any useful, right? So, uh, I mean, right, basically here, you can predict everything to be negative and get 99% accuracy, right? Because sort of the false positive and false negatives essentially are weighted the same, right? So accuracy is really a poor metric for uh, strongly mis uh, sort of imbalanced data sets. And so that's why it's important to actually do look at um, specifically the cases, right, and according to which you 
classify the positive and the negative examples correctly or incorrectly, which leads to this sort of table here, which is sometimes referred to as the confusion uh, matrix, uh, confusion table of that resulting binary classifier, right? And so it's basically a two by two matrix where the, uh, the columns refer to the true label, right? So the example is either positive or negative, and the rows correspond to the predicted label, right? And these are four numbers that just count the number of occurrences, right? So once you apply the classifier, right, you, you just look at how many of these, uh, of these cases do you get, right? Um, and uh, let's just introduce a little bit of notation here. Uh, so let's refer to the sum over the positive row. So this is the ones that we predict positive. So the, the, the row sum here, we, we call this P plus. So that's the, those, the things that we predicted to be positive. Right? Um, and of course, it can be a true positive or it could be a false positive. Right, so that we don't care about here. And the same here, right? We, this is our predicted minuses, false negatives, or the true negatives. And the same thing here across the columns. Right, so the sum here is just the total number of positive examples. Right, and this is the total number of negative examples. Right, the column, uh, column sum here, right? And then just n is the sum over all of those, right? So it's n plus plus n minus or uh, equivalently p plus uh, plus p minus, right? It's just the, uh, the, the data set size. Okay, so we care about essentially all these four cases, right? And now we can think about metrics um, that we, in the end, may care to, to optimize in some way or the other, right? Because, I mean, in the end, you somehow do want to use things like cross-validation in order to say, here's the best model I would want to use for that data set. But in cross-validation, right, you need to actually compute some number, right? You need to compute some performance metric. I already said accuracy is maybe not the metric you care about if you have strongly balanced data, right? So it means that now in order to have something that we can try to optimize, so using cross-validation, we somehow need to take this confusion matrix and turn it into some number that we can then hope to optimize. And the question is sort of which number should we pick in lieu of the accuracy? Right? And there's actually, um, actually a whole slew of such numbers. Um, but basically here, right, so just to have this, have this concrete example, right, so depending on how we say which method we use, right, or the way you, we might choose the, uh, the straight-off parameter, right, we uh, now would get different amounts of, uh, say this is the model, W1, W2, and W3, and here different, we would get different amounts of, uh, say, false positives and false negatives, right? So just to double check, so um, W1, right, essentially classifies, so let me try the normal vector here, right? So they all point in that direction, just to be clear, right? Uh, so that's the direction of the positive class, right, the normal vector of the hyperplane. So basically, um, W1, classifies everything here as minus, everything there is plus. So what happens to false positive, false negatives? So basically, it classifies, there's no false negatives, right? So everything it's, it says it's negative is really negative, right? So there's zero false negatives, but there's of course lots of false positives, right? All these points here, right, in that regime, uh, they're, uh, there's lots of, uh, of false positives, right? So similarly, if you think about um, the other extreme, right, W3 would have zero false positives, right? Because everything it says it's positive is really positive, right? But of course, there's lots of false negatives. Right? And so W2, right, makes, so it classifies these two points here, right, as positive. So there's a few false positives. And classifies those two here as negative, even though they're positive, right? So it's few false positives and false negatives, right? So two, I think, in this case. Okay? 
just to be concrete about this here, right? And now the question is, right, so I can work out the other numbers, um, of course, right? And then the question is sort of how to take essentially this confusion matrix and turn it into a single scalar that we end sort of could think about validating and optimizing, right? And there's actually a whole bunch of such, such metrics. So the first one we had talked about is accuracy, right? And so the accuracy in terms of the entries of this confusion matrix, so how is it defined if this is this matrix here, right? It's just the things we got right divided by the total number of cases, right? So it's the, to the true positives plus the true negatives divided by n, right? Divided by everything, right? So this is just true positives plus true negatives divided by n. It's just the usual notion of accuracy that we've been always talking about so far, right? But there's other things as well. So two that are very widely used um, uh, and the aggregates are called precision recall and the F1 score. Let me explain. Uh, so what's precision? Uh, so precision basically looks at the cases that you predict to be positive, and among all those, it asks what's the fraction of true positives. Okay, so it's the true positives divided by um, the true positives plus the false positives, which is this, so it's basically just P plus, right? So among everything you predict to be plus, what's the fraction of true pluses? Okay, that's called the precision, right? Among the things that you retrieve, right, what's the, what's the fraction of, of sort of positive examples, right? See, so your spam filter, right, that's through a bunch of email messages, sends them to the to their inbox. So that among the email messages that it sends to your inbox, what's the fraction of of non-spam messages, right? That's precision, right? And recall is closely related. So a call is basically um, the uh, true, uh, true positives divided by the total number of positives. So among all the non-spam messages, right? The ones you actually want to get, What's the fraction of them that you recall, right? That's the rationality behind, behind that term, right? And so, so both of those, right, obviously are between zero and one, right? So both of them are in zero, one, right? And now, obviously, ideally, you'd like to have both of them close to one, right? So you want to... Only, right, if you make no mistakes at all, if you classify everything perfectly, right, then you would have true positives, so there would be no false positives, right, so both of this would be one, and here there would be no false negatives, so both of them would be one, right? But in general, that's going to be a trade-off between those two things, right? So you can either increase the precision or you can increase the recall, okay? And now that these are sort of two uh, metrics that are in contention, right? So they're essentially a way of taking these four numbers from this confusion matrix to boil them down to two, right, that care about sort of these different aspects. And now you can sort of try to turn this into a single number that you might care about in the end. And one way to do that that's very widely used, say in information retrieval, for example, is the F1 score, which is defined to be by this, this expression here. So that's the harmonic mean of precision and recall. Harmonic mean of uh, precision and recall, okay? And so what is, uh, what is that? So the harmonic mean um, is just the, um, the inverse of the average of the inverses, okay? So it's a little of a mouthful, so let's write it down. So it's basically, um, it's, uh, the average, so we have, okay, let me write it a little bit up here, right? Uh, so we have the inverse of the average, right, of two terms, so there's going to be a true in the numerator, okay, and now we have the inverse of the precision, the inverse of the recall, so the inverse of the precision is true positives plus false positives divided by true positives, right, plus the inverse of the recall is true positives plus false negatives divided by true positives, right, which happens to be this number up here, right, so, uh, so this is just two, okay, so I don't have to spell it out, right, 
So this is just uh, evaluates this quantity. And so why is the harmonic mean? So, I mean, you could have taken just the mean or some other aggregate of these two numbers. So the harmonic mean is sort of um, something like the average, but it's sort of biased towards the smaller number. Okay, so the average of two numbers, sort of the harmonic mean of two numbers is always less or equal to the average of the two numbers. Okay, so it means somehow if you have a good F1 score, then you better have both good precision and recall. That's the rationale behind it. Okay? So that's sort of one way of basically uh, now taking an imbalanced problem, right, and quantifying um, somehow the performance of a, of a classifier on it. Okay, now that's something you could give to cross-validation, actually try to optimize. So that's a pretty common case that arises in practical applications. And of course, the question is how do you obtain this trade-off? Well, using what we've discussed before, right? So you would basically use, say, um, a cost-sensitive classifier, like the cost-sensitive perceptron or cost-sensitive SVM, right, as we had discussed in the, at the beginning of the lecture today, right? And now you can vary the trade-off parameters, C plus divided by C minus, and sweep over basically this single parameter, this number, right? And that will give you a bunch of solutions. And among those, you can say, pick the one that has the largest F1 score, for example. Okay, so another thing that could be done is you can actually say, let me try to, so it's not, quite the same thing, at least not in general, that you say I've fit a single solution, a single classifier, and it just shifts the hyperplane by a certain amount. Okay, so say I have a bunch of um, positive examples over here, and a bunch of negative examples. Okay, so I guess I have to draw many now. Uh, we rather erase those, right? So, something like this, right? And then uh, you would normally have a hyperplane that you would get, right? And then essentially you can shift it in either direction by tau, right? That's sort of, so instead of classifying it zero, right, you threshold um, you take f of, uh, f of x, right, so sort of w transpose x, and you compare it not with zero, but you compare it against some threshold, and you vary the threshold. Okay, that's sort of a cheaper and often still sort of effective way of achieving this kind of trade-off, right? And we'll give you different solutions. These are all now parallel to w. In general, using option one, they're not always in, uh, parallel. Yes? Could this tau be some kind of a priori knowledge <coughs> Yeah, so, so now the question is, where do you get tau from, right? Um, and so, the, so, so uh, and maybe hold that thought until sometime later in uh, this course. We'll actually talk about sort of principled ways of making these kind of, si of decisions, uh, but that's only a few lectures from now. So maybe for now, just think about this as a tuning parameter, right? And say you can vary tau in order to realize different classifiers that have different precision and recall, say, right? And hence... Um, realize this trade-off, right, between the positive and negative examples uh, in different ways. Okay? And so what you get is something like these pictures here, right, so which I call precision recall curves, where you what plot precision versus recall, right? Uh, so x-axis being, say, the recall, and the y-axis the precision. Both are numbers between 0 and 1, as we said, right? And now, why is, are these curves? Why is not just a single number? That we said we get a whole family of classifiers. Right? So we get one classifier, say, for each choice of the straight off parameters, C plus over C minus. Right? We could resolve, say, the SVM problem for each of these, this ratio parameter, each value for this ratio parameter. And for each of them, we get some amount of recall and some amount of precision. And now we can think about tracing that curve as we vary the straight off parameter. Well, similarly, on this option two here, right, as we vary tau, we slide this hyperplane, right? between the, po the positive and negative examples and would trade false positives versus false negatives, um, each resulting in different um, value for precision and recall, right? And hence giving us these kind of curves. 
Okay? And so in some sense, this position recall curve summarizes what you can possibly get out of a given classification method for cost-sensitive classification, right? It sort of this, uh, presents this trade-off to you. And now you can say, well, I want to fix a certain amount of recall or fix a certain amount of precision, and then sort of try to see if I, what's the best recall I can get and vice versa. Okay, so that's what you often see these kind of precision recall curves when talking about uh, cost-sensitive uh, classification. Yep. That's uh, um, uh, particular properties of, of these two resulting algorithms. So it's, you can't really say that in general, right? So this is just sort of what you might say if you now compare two algorithms, right? You might not just say, so uh, the accuracy of algorithm one is such and the accuracy of algorithm two is such, right? But you actually present this whole trade-off, right? You present this position recall curve. You get one for algorithm one, one for algorithm two, right? And so here you might say conclude, right, that uh, algorithm two provides much higher precision if you want to have large recall, right? Say for this small recall, right, they have roughly similar precision, but for large recall, um, if you want to really recall most of the, say, relevant mess email messages, say, right, um, then uh, algorithm two would be preferred in this case, right? That's the sort of comparison that you would make um, using a plot like this, okay? And which of them is more important really depends on the application, right? So this is just a way of thinking about uh, cost-sensitive classification and validating these resulting methods. So there's more metrics even. So uh, um, let me talk about this, these as well. So basically, um, because the, you also see those often. So instead of precision and recall, there's two other metrics that are closely related that um, are also often used when talking about uh, cost-sensitive classification, namely the true positive rate and the false negative, uh, false, false, excuse me, false positive rate. Um, and so uh, the true positive rate, in fact, is the same as the recall. It's defined in exactly the way. It's just a different name for the same thing. So true positives over the number of positive examples, right? So everything is sort of truly positive or what you falsely classified as negative. And the false positive rate is basically the false positives um, among everything that is actually negative. Okay, so among all negative examples, what's the fraction that you declare, falsely declare to be positive? Right, so the true negatives plus the false positives are also negative examples. So it's the false positives divided by n minus, right, the number of negative examples. Okay, and so why are these also useful to look at? So there's one property that's sort of nice about them, makes it sort of easy to understand, so relatively um, easy to understand. So basically, so, so if, you, if you think about, um, if you think about, how good is your classifier, right? So that question, right? The question is sort of what's the natural baseline, okay? And now the natural baseline might be just guess at random, right? So you guess the label at random, okay? And so now in case a data set is balanced, right, and you really guess at random, right? Say I, I just predict, uh, positive or negative label with probably a half each, right, then uh, um, right, your accuracy would be a half, right? So everything that's sort of higher than a half, right, would be, say, better than random guessing, at least to some amount, right? Of course, there's variance as well, right? But, but that's sort of the natural benchmark to compare, right? As you said, if you just talk about accuracy, right, um, just predicting, um, say, just uh, say predicting only one class or doing uh, random guessing equally likely is sort of not the right not the right reference. But of course, what you could also do is you could say, well, let me actually predict positive or negative with the probability that's different from a half. Okay, and so you can try to understand what happens with the true positive rate and the true false positive rate as you just predict the random label. Okay, so consider um, a random sort of randomly predicting. 
completely independently of the data, plus with probability p. All right? And we can ask, what would be the true positive rate and the false positive rate for this highly sophisticated classifier? Right? So let's try to work out so the true positive rate. Of course, this is sort of here the actual number, so let's talk about the expected true positive rate, where the expectation is over this random prediction. Would be what? Well, in order to be a true positive, two things must have happened, right? So basically, the example must have been positive, and you must have classified it as positive. But whether you classify it as positive or not is independent of the data, right? So the expected number of examples that you classify as positive is just p times n plus. Right? So this is just p times n plus. OK? And of course, divided by n plus, which is just p. Right? Now, the same for the expected false positive rate. Right? False positive rate. Uh, so what would you do here, right? So in order to be a false, um, false positive, well, you, you would have looked at a negative example and then happened to classify it positively, right? But there's n minus such negative examples. Each of them, there's a chance of p of classifying it positively. So it's just p times n minus divided by n, n minus, which convenience, conveniently it just evaluates to p. Okay? So basically, this random classifier that just predicts positive with probability p precisely has uh, true, and, uh, true positive rate and false positive rate of p. Okay? And now, of course, you can uh, imagine what we can do, right? We can sort of take um, the same kind of curve, but now instead of precision and recall, uh, plot the false positive rate uh, versus the true positive rate. Right? So again, these are two quantities that compete with each other. Both are between 0 and 1. If you do everything right, Right? If there's no false negatives, false, no false, uh, no, tr uh, uh, yeah. So, so, okay. So, if the, if there's no false negatives and no false positives, uh, in this case, true positive rate will be one, and false positive rate will be zero, right? So, in an ideal world, you'd be up here, right? This is where you want to be, right? Now, if you have some family of classifiers, right? Say cost-sensitive SVMs that give you a bunch of different solutions, right? You would trade the true and false positive rates that give you curves like those, right? Say for algorithm one and two, right? And of course, now you can say, well, what would be my baseline? Well, my baseline would just be the diagonal line here, right? So this is a random, realizable, by a random prediction, right? As you sweep p from 0 to 1, right, you get always true and false positive rate exactly p, right? And so you trace the diagonal. So everything that's sort of up here, right, is good, right? So you want to sort of be in the top left corner. And if you're down here, <laughs> then you're better off by random guessing, right? Like sort of close to the diagonal. Okay, so now these are two different curves that sort of show the same thing. They're closely related. Okay, in fact, that can be shown. So you can basically show um, uh, sort of inclusion relationships. So for example, if you have two algorithms, one and two, and one is strictly better in terms of the precision recall curve, then it's also strictly better with respect to uh, the... Um, this ROC curve, so this is called receiver operating, uh, oper uh, operator characteristic. It's just a historical name is given to this, uh, to this kind of plot. Okay? So in some sense, if one algorithm is strictly better than the other in one of these curves, it's also going to be strictly better than the other uh, in the other curve. That's not too hard to show. What does strictly better mean? Well, if I fix any value on the x-axis, 
you must be at least as good in the y-axis. So Pareto dominates the other curve. Okay? So those two curves here, the, there's, none of them dominates each other, right? So for example, in this comparison here, right, there's some small parts here where algorithm one does a little better, right? And then some parts where algorithm two does a little better for any fixed amount of recall. Right? But you might have a situation that is another algorithm, right, that sort of is somewhere down here, right? And here now algorithm one and two are strictly better than this one. And then this theorem says that now this green curve must also be somewhere around here, right? Must be strictly below those two curves. Okay. Anyway, so you'll see both of those, right? They're both sort of giving you information about sort of how well these algorithms are able to trade the false positives versus the false negatives, right? Um, and that's, uh, so that's basically, uh, so these are very widely used. Also, one more, more important thing is, so basically these curves, so what we had talked about before, so for cost-sensitive classification, right? Not, you can't just look at accuracy, you have to really look at this confusion matrix. And we talked about how we can essentially take this confusion matrix and say quantify things like precision recall, right? Or true positive and true negative rates. Okay? Um, but now what you're saying is actually these curves say something more. They some, say something about the ability of the classifier to navigate this trade-off between true positives and true negatives. Right? So essentially it's a statement about many different solutions to the same classification problem, say for different ratios of C plus over C minus. Right? So say different cost ratios. Right? So these curves actually not just compare two different, say, hyperplanes with each other, but two different ways of generating hyperplanes, right, linear classifiers. So that's an important distinction. And now what you can do is you can say, well, suppose I have these two algorithms, right? So I have, say, the cost-sensitive perceptron, and I have this cost-sensitive support vector machine. Now, which one is better? Well, in the end, you'll just get one of these curves, right? So algorithm one versus algorithm two. And you might say, well, if the one of them is always strictly above the other, then it's maybe better. But that's typically not the case, right? That's typically really some kind of trade-offs. And so what's sometimes done is to now take these curves and in turn turn them into a number. Okay, and one natural number to look here is to look at the area under these curves. Right, you would take this curve and then basically compute uh, this volume, right, below this curve, right, that integral. Okay? And clearly now, right, so in the precision recall curve, um, so in the ROC curve, right, um, the best you can do is you can somehow say be up here, right? Um, so essentially, sort of the ideal classifier shoots up here, goes all to the one and stays at one, right? And that clearly has a volume of one, right? Contains all the area. And the trivial random baseline that we had talked about, so right, is the diagonal line. Of course, the resulting area is a half, right? So essentially, the dynamic range between this metric here is now between a half and one, right? And the closer you are to, to one, the better. If it's less than half, then maybe there's something wrong. Okay? And now this really gives you a way, in principle, to compare two different algorithms, right? And you still later on have the, uh, the flexibility on sort of um, realizing this trade-off in one way or the other. Okay, and you can do this both for the RSC curve or the area on the precision recall curve, right? Just sort of mention, so these are a whole bunch of metrics that are actually very widely used um, because sort of imbalanced uh, classification tasks are actually very common. So just to, what you need to know on this, and then we'll take the break, is basically uh, we talked about these basic techniques for handling imbalanced data, sort of these simple ideas like up and down sampling. We've talked about ways to sort of try to simulate this upsampling into the design of the cost function. Right? By having sort of this label dependent coefficient in front of the loss contributions. And then this gives us a trade in trade off parameter through which we can find multiple different solutions. And now we've talked about metrics for evaluating and comparing these different, uh, these different solutions. Right? So, like precision recall, F1 score. Uh, as well as sort of ROC or precision recall curves, the area under the curve, et cetera, right? And to just sort of augment our, uh, our table here, right? So where does this fit? Well, sort of 
um, it fits in the context of loss functions, where right? we now sort of have these loss sense, cost sensitive variants of loss functions. That's a very useful idea, very, very widely applied. Um, as well as other evaluation metrics, right down here, right? So that instead of just having say mean squared error and accuracy, you now sort of have things like F1 score, area in the curve, precision recall, and, uh, and these sort of things, okay? So let's take the break now and uh, then after the break, we'll actually talk about a uh, multi-class classification. So let's take a break now. Okay. Please sit down again so that we can continue. <clears throat> so as the next topic, I want to discuss something that sort of sounds quite different, but it's actually quite related to what we've discussed. In particular, we want to talk about multi-class classification. And so, of course, so far, we've focused on binary uh, classification problems, right? And clearly, a lot of applications, you have more than two possible classes uh, that we might want to classify to, right? And so we've seen many examples in the first lecture. Um, Right, so you might think about text classification, right, classifying whatever is in news articles according to different topics, uh, et cetera. Right? So there's plenty of examples where, given some input, you might want to attach a discrete um, label to it, the category, but there's more than two. Right? And so we'll use C uh, for the number of classes for notation. Right? So now, basically, our data set consists of pairs of uh, inputs and labels. Inputs, again, are going to be our feature vectors, and the labels are now going to be numbers ranging from 1 to C, right? So no longer plus, minus, right? Uh, but actually uh, numbers ranging from, uh, from 1 to C. Okay, so that's the setup, right? And then given this, we do want to uh, fit the function, right, that we can use in order to make predictions about examples we haven't seen yet, right? So this might uh, look like this here, right, so now we have three classes, say, pluses, minuses, and, and the stars. Uh, and uh, so that means that now, say, we are no longer interested in the bipartition of the space, right, but partition the space into three classes, such that we would attach the corresponding label to each of these different parts of the partition, right? So that should be pretty clear. And now the question, of course, is how do we do it? In particular, do we have to invent something new for these multi-class problems, or can we use somehow what we've used before. And I want to give you a flavor of both directions, right? So it turns out there's a whole family of approaches that basically are based on reductions, so that reduce multi-class classification problems to binary classification problems. And of course, the useful aspect of that is that you can use any of the techniques we've discussed for binary classification in order to then do multi-class classification. Um, but there's also explicit multi-class um, hypotheses that you can try to fit, and it'll get, give you a bit of a sense of that as well, and that is actually extensively used also in what is to, going to come in the next lectures, maybe using neural networks, for example, for multi-class classification. So then typically, you sort of try to directly do multi-class uh, classification. Okay, so uh, uh, let's, let's do this, and so I'll start with the reductions. Okay, and so, um, Here's one reduction that's very widely used. It's called one versus all. And basically works as follows. So what you're going to do is you're going to try to reduce this problem of multi-class classification to a bunch of binary classification problems. And in fact, uh, we'll try to uh, re re reduce it to C binary classification problems, namely one for each class. Okay, and the task of so basically, we try and train C binary classifiers, one for each class. And now the job of the ith uh, classifier is simply to try to tell, do you have an example from that class I or something else? Right? So you classify one particular class indexed by I against everything that's from a different class. Right? So conceptually, it's a very straightforward thing. So for example, if you were to uh, class to have this, uh, this example here, right? so this data set, 
uh, say we might start with the positive class, right, and try to classify it against all the others. So essentially, we trade, create sort of a new data set um, where we have the, the pluses, say, as the positive examples, and all the other labels, the minuses and the stars, as negative examples, right? And this may give us a classifier that might look like this, right? Say, let's call it W plus. It's related to the, this class, right? Then we might do uh, the same thing for, uh, for the minus, this class here, right? So this is W minus. And last, we would have a classifier for our stars, which is maybe down here. Right, um, which uh, which tries to tell the star starts from everything else. Okay, so that's basically uh, basically the idea. And now uh, the question is, how do you how do you aggregate uh, the resulting solution? Right, because now we sort of have three different uh, three different uh, classifiers, right? That might, right? So that you would give some training example that would output some predictions, some binary prediction. And now from those binary predictions, you want to uh, get back the, uh, the true class label, right? So it means you have to sort of use those in order to now uh, determine the class label, right? Or the partition of the, uh, of the domain. Okay, and so uh, the way that this is typically done, it's actually also different strategies, but so the way this is typically done is to use classifiers that are not just actually give binary predictions, um, but they actually predict a confidence score. Okay, and so I'm not talking about sort of a statistical notion of confidence, like confidence intervals, but some geometric notion of confidence. I'll just say what I mean by that in a moment. Uh, so basically, so each classifier I attaches a confidence or predicts a confidence um, f i of x, right? Say in the linear setting, in the linear uh, linear case, this might just be uh, w i transpose x, um, and so it not actually gives a binary score, but it gives a real valued score, and now you determine which class it is by just assigning it to the classifier that expresses largest confidence. So you would then predict y hat as the argmax over i in 1 to c of wi transpose x. Okay, so uh, what do we mean by confidence and sort of what's the rationale behind this? So let's just talk about this a bit. So basically, uh, suppose we have this binary class. We can already talk about it here, right? Say we have, say tell the pluses from all the non-pluses, right? Maybe this is our classifier, right? So we have this normal vector, W, or W plus, right, attached with Right, they'll just drop the plus here, right? That's sort of the, res the, cl the classifier respons responsible to picking out the examples labeled plus, right, from one of the classes. And now the idea basically just being that um, W trans transpose X sort of measures how far you are in plus land, right? How far you are away from this decision boundary. Right? So W transpose X is proportional 
to how far you are, how far away you are from the decision boundary in the domain of the positive class. Right? So here, say if this is x1, let me use a different color here. Say the, oops, say this here is x1, this is x2, right? And so here we would have, say, well, let me, to be even more direct, right? So x2, so x2 is much closer, so this is x2, right? This is here x1. Uh, so x, x1 is further away from the decision boundary than x2, right? Uh, so here, uh, w transpose x1 is greater than w transpose x2, right? You sort of are more confident in x1 and less confident uh, in, in x2, okay? So you can sort of think about you have these different classifiers, right? And you ask each of them, right, how far is the current example inside your domain? Right, that's sort of the idea. Does anyone see a potential issue with this here? There's one subtlety I want to just mention. So this is a relative assessment, right? So basically W transpose X, right? So here just says W transpose X1 is bigger than W uh, transpose X, uh, X, uh, X2. So what if I scale up W by a factor of a thousand? <laughs> that same relation would still hold, right? The direction, the, the classifier use is still the same. If I were to make binary decisions, just look at its sign, I would still get the same binary label. But the confidence score would be scaled up by a factor of a thousand. Right? So uh, this means, right, that if I now want to use the confidence score that each classifier attaches to its example, to determine the label, then I should be worried about this normalization issue, right? So if I take classifier of the positive class here, right, and I just scale it up by a factor of a thousand, right, then uh, um, it's somehow, right, it's sort of much more likely to maximize this inner product here. Right, that's sort of the uh, the uh, the idea. Right, there's some sort of normalization issue. Right, so there's uh, right. So basically, if I have uh, sort of W and alpha times w implement the same classifier, same binary classifier, but with a very different, possibly very different uh, confidence score. Right? And now there's different ways to fix this, okay? So one could be to say, let me just solve the linear classifier, and I just normalize all the weights to one. Right, I remove the scaling, right, by just normalizing them all to the same length. So one solution basically just set W i for each class divided by the length of wi. And in this case, this confidence score here is actually just the Euclidean distance of the point from the hyperplane. Right? That's sort of a clear geometric interpretation for each of the binary classifiers. Right? So that's one way to do it. Now the second solution is actually if you use regularization, you automatically impose some form of scale. 
right? So if you fit the support vector machine, you have this complexity penalty term, right? So it prevents the support vector machine to use arbitrarily large weights, right? So regularization sort of takes care of the scale already, right? So in fact, regularization Uh, e.g., right, SVMs um, sort of uh, so just informally write here, right, take care of the scale. Uh, anyways, right? So essentially, if you just train, say, binary support vector machines for each of these different classes, and you just look at the resulting W transpose X, so the response of that SVM, this is a really good confidence score. Okay, and you can just directly uh, apply this, this algorithm on the previous slide. Now let's just sort of talk about what does this concretely entail? So for now, let's actually think about all the weights as being normalized to unit length. So what really matters is the Euclidean distance of the point to the hyperplane. So what is the resulting decision boundary? Right, so in this plot here, what is the resulting decision boundary? Right, so which point do we, uh, do we uh, sort of label as plus versus minus, uh, et cetera? Okay. <clears throat> so let's think about the intersections of these um, of these decision boundaries, right? So if you think about, for example, this point here, then this is sort of away from the negative class, right? Certainly not going to be labeled minus, because the sort of the negative, the minus W will be negative, right? But the, the W for the pluses and the stars will be zero, right? So it actually there's a tie, right, between these two. So it's indifferent with respect to those classes. So it sort of has to go through here. Um, also similarly, right, similar rationale, let me just actually use the, okay, let me use the blue color here for the final decision boundary. Let's go through this. And now we have to sort of think about what is, which points are equally far away, right? So the other point that sort of is equally far away is basically this point in the middle of this triangle here. Right, that sort of has the same Euclidean distance, okay? And so now, if we draw a line through here, this is basically all the points that are equally far away from the positive class and the stars, this is the points equally far away from the pluses and the mi minuses, and the points uh, sort of equally far away between the, uh, the stars and the minuses, right? So that's the resulting decision boundaries you get. So everything down here will be stars, right? So down here you'll predict minus, and up here you'll predict pluses, right? So here you'll predict pluses, right? Here you'll predict star, right? And uh, so up here, right, you predict minuses and so on, right? So you see what I mean. This is sort of the resulting decision boundaries you would get if you had normalized the weights precisely to unit length. Okay, so that's sort of the simplest possible multi-class classifier, right? Just take um, the SVM, binary SVM, train three SVMs for the three classes, right, or C SVMs, so C classes, and then just predict the resulting confidence, right? Look at W transpose C for each class, and I'll put the, the, the class with the highest score. All right, so, uh, so that's sort of the, the simplest possible uh, sort of multi-class classifier that often actually works quite well. And we'll see this idea of actually maintaining multiple classifiers that predict some real-valued response, which in the end then is turned into a discrete class label through the argmax, that's essentially the standard approach for multi-class classification, also in other um, models like neural networks, for example. Okay, we'll see this uh, quite a bit more again, right? So essentially, you predict instead of having just a single valued output, right, a single f of x, as we had talked about for regression and classification so far, here multi-class you actually predict multiple outputs, say one per class, and then you do something with that resulting vector, right? Say, for example, looking at the largest score. Okay, so uh, that's basically one versus all. Uh, so this is sort of what we had worked out before. Okay, so anyways, um, so the challenges with one versus all, so what might be possible issues? 
Well, so this one is this that we talked about only works if the classifiers produce confidence scores. Not all of them might actually, right? But typically you get some notion of confidence. Um, and uh, sort of they need to be on the same scale to work, right? That's what we, uh, what we had seen here. Right? And you can either normalize or sort of use regularization to ensure the scale. Uh, now, another issue relates to the first part of today's lecture. Well, if you do one versus all the other classes, well, that's the prime example of imbalanced data. Right? Even if you have a balanced data set and you have a thousand classes, right, then uh, right, each class is only a thousandth of the data points. Right? So that's a prime use case for thinking about un un imbalanced classification problems. OK, but we know how to deal with this. Right? We've discussed this before. And last, uh, so one class might actually not be uh, linearly separable from other classes. That's a little more tricky. And this is sort of, suppose you have this sort of situation here, right? Pluses, minuses, and stars, right? Clearly, you can do the pluses versus all. Clearly, you can do the stars versus all, but good luck with the minuses versus all, right? Even though, right, this is a clearly linearly separable problem, right? So that's sort of a, a case where one versus all can fail. OK? So that's a potential issue. Yes? Aha, uh -huh, sure, absolutely. Right? So the polynomial will already take care of this. Right? Absolutely. Right? If you use an RBF kernel, whatever, right? So it'll work. That's why it's not a big deal, right? But you can construct these cases, right? So for linear classification, it would not work. OK. Um, good. So now if you do one versus all, you can do also other things. So in particular, another popular one is one versus one. And that's sort of partly motivated from this last issue here, right? Um, say, even though the minuses are not linearly separable from the pluses and the stars, they're easily linearly separable from one of the classes. So I can tell minuses versus pluses easily and minuses versus the stars easily, right? So what you could just as well do is I could now say for each pair of classes, I'm going to train a classifier that distinguishes them. Right? So I train a classifier that tells pluses versus, um, uh, pluses versus uh, stars. I take a classifier that, that uh, tells pluses versus minuses, and so on. Right? Um, so just a concrete example here, right? So this, so I might have one that tells, um, say, plus. So this here one is plus, plus versus uh, minus, right? And I would have, say, um, one of uh, So this here is star versus uh, plus, right? And maybe I have another one uh, for minuses. So minus versus plus we have, right? Minus versus stars is one that we still need, right? Just do it. Try to do it like, okay, so I now I have to create a little bit of ambiguity here. Okay, so let's do it like this. So this is basically, uh, say, star versus minus, right? You know, we all have all three choose two uh, pairwise classifiers, right? And so now, now what, right? So now we can ask each of them, right? How do you resolve this tie, right? Sort of this, this pairwise comparison and need to turn it into final score. And so here, uh, the way the reduction works is actually, in this case, it turns out to, to be enough to just um, look at um, basically have votes. So you would have each classifier a vote. So it's not even a confidence score. And then um, the class with the highest number of votes uh, wins. Okay? So if you say we would have. Um, so basically, yeah. Uh, let's 
see. So if there's Okay, so let's let's do it like this. So so here, um, clearly the regions where votes can change, right, are only essentially those that you get by from the resulting partitions, right? You have these by by partitions, right? So linear hyperplanes that will sort of partition uh, tile, right, the plane here, right, into these polygonal regions, right? And within each of these regions, so for example, this region up here, right. So here the votes won't change, right? Similarly here in this region, the votes won't change, right? And so on. So you can look at sort of all of these tiles, right? And within each of them, this method will attach the same label, okay? And so basically what you would say is you would say, um, so, so here, uh, you, you would say, so let's take these examples here, right? So the pluses. So you would ask um, the, the two classifiers, right, that participate in the positive class, uh, do you vote for me or no, right? So here this plus versus minus, right, would say I vote for a plus, and the plus versus star would say I vote for a plus, right? So here's two votes for a plus, right, and no votes for any of the other classes, right? So the votes, if you say votes for... Uh, plus, minus, star, right, would be 2, 0, 0, right? Uh, so now here, in this case, right, you would still, what, is, what happens here? So again, right, this votes for plus, and this one votes for plus as well, right? So this is also 2. Uh, zero, zero, right? So th those here would basically be labeled plus, right? Would be labeled plus, right? And you can sort of work out all these remaining regions of how would they would be classified, right? Now the question is, um, what happens? Uh, what what happens down here, right? And here, basically, all of them vote for vote for a given class, right? So. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, one thing we forgot, right? So this is, uh, this one we would also ask, right? Sorry, we should. Uh, so the my, this, this one here, right, would in one case say, I vote for star, right? So this would be a one here, right? And this one would say, I vote for minus, right? So it's actually quite a, a little different, right? So this is, okay, so this is hopefully clear, right? So here you got one, two votes for plus, one for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for star, right, and here one for minus, right? And you can do the same thing, right? And of course, in the middle here, right, no one knows what, what, should, what to do, right? So they're all classes get a vote, right? And so you have to break the tie somehow. Okay, but that's basically um, how this works, right? And you can generalize it, yes. Then you have to decide how to resolve these ties, exactly. Same as here, right, in some sense, right? You can have ties even for uneven number of classes. Okay? But that's basically the idea. It's really simple, right? This actually just uses binary classification, not even a notion of confidence. Okay? A super simple scheme. Yeah. Question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, why is it 2, 0, 1? Why, why is it 3, uh, 0, 0? No, this here has just asked uh, star versus minus. This is not even asked this is the plus or not. Right? Okay. Right, and so now basically here just the class with the highest number of positive predictions wins. Okay, so that's the, uh, so, and that's different scheme, different variants of these reductions, right? But that's sort of a standard one. Now, sort of comparisons, well, um, so what's the, the so difference here, right, between these two uh, reductions that I've mentioned? Um, well, so one versus all is certainly Appealing in the sense that it just uses C classifiers, one for each class, right? Versus this one versus one, well, needs C squared, right? Or C choose two, right? Which scales quadratically with the number of classes, right? And if you have three classes, maybe it's not a big deal, um, right? If you have a thousand classes, this might be a problem, right? That's sort of one of the issues, right? Um, on the other hand, sort of this... 
uh, the one versus all actually do needs this form of confidence in the prediction, right? And uh, does lead to class imbalance versus the other one wouldn't, right? Of course, if you have quadratically many models, right, that's too slow to, uh, you, uh, too slow to train, right? But you actually uh, don't really need this confidence score. Okay, so these are sort of two uh, flavors of reductions. Um, so what else can one do? So it turns out there's some other ideas one can do. So there's further ideas of reductions beyond this one versus one and one versus all schemes. And there, there's also these explicit multi-class model, uh, multi-class predictions. I just want to talk about uh, them briefly to give you an idea of what can be done there. Uh, but just to remark that uh, so one versus all and one versus one often actually works quite well. So if you don't have sort of a large number of classes, et cetera, right, and a manageable size data set, these are sort of standard uh, techniques that actually work very well. <laughs> Good. So here, let's actually try to ask the following question, right? Suppose I, I have a, 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 a multi-class problem with C classes, and I somehow want to re reduce it to binary classification, to a bunch of binary classification problems. So purely conceptually, right? So we've talked about one versus all with C classes and one versus one, right? Which gets sort of C choose too many classes, right? Classifiers. But of course, these sort of are two particular schemes. Can we do something else? In particular, can we actually get away with something less than, uh, than C classes? Right, so it's less than C uh, binary classifiers. Any ideas? Yeah, so what you could do is you could take an encoding of C as a binary string and just classify each bit. Right? So you could just do something like, so use a binary encoding. Right, so here's C. Right, so... So here's sort of sorry, the, the class, right? Say encoding, right? Say this would be, um, now let me start at zero up to one, uh, just C minus one, right? So obviously it's just shifted by one, right? Uh, so here is just the binary encoding of this, right? So zero, okay, whatever, I should have. Right, so here. Right, and in the end, whatever, if this happens to be 2 to the n minus 1, right, you might get something like this, right? And so now you can view this as basically, well, the number of binary classification tasks as the number of bits in my encoding, right? So I would now say... I bits... Right? Um, and then sort of I use I binary classifiers. Uh, task of classifier I is to predict bit I. Right? So in principle, you could do that, right? And obviously, you get away with log, right? Log to basis two, um, right? So, uh, of C, right? So in principle, you can get away with logarithmically many, uh, many uh, classifiers. Now, whether it's an easy task to sort of just predict that I is bit is a whole different story, right? So just the fact that I've written down sort of I... Uh, see different binary classification problems doesn't mean they're sort of easy to solve. And of course, that's sort of where, the, where there's the crux. Okay? But this idea of using some form of encoding um, actually has been explored. And there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, um, of ideas of using ideas of encoding theory in order to do so multi-class classification, right? And so, for example, you can do things like error correcting output, uh, output codes, right? Or Hamming codes and these sort of things, right? So whatever, you can sort of take these five class labels maybe represent them with four bits, right? And here, the Hamming distance of each of these uh, bit vectors is at least two, so it means I at least detect a mistake, right, of, uh, of one bit. 
um, right? If it's not a perfect classification, right? Or if I sort of think about, uh, I can use an encoding, say, of length six here, right? Where the distance, the Hamming distance, the number of bits according to which any two of these binary encodings differ is at least three. So it means that even if one of these bits is incorrectly classified, I can still sort of get the correct class. Right? That's sort of the idea. Right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, but these sort of things can work, right? And can actually be pretty robust. Okay? And again, sort of just a reduction, right, to, uh, to simple binary, uh, binary classification problems. Okay? So the last thing um, that we want to discuss is actually an explicit multi-class classification uh, technique. And um, uh, we'll discuss this uh, in the next week. And then we'll basically start uh, with neural networks as the new topic that we discuss here. Okay, see you next week.